uh, to uh, like to get to. Uh, we'll sing a couple of songs, and then uh, Dr. Williams going to give us uh, uh, a good word, and, um, and then we're going to have uh, after that. I believe we're going to have some Q and A. Is that right? Is that correct? Right? Okay. So, uh, so I'm going to I'm going to ask you to stand, and we're going to start actually by singing. Uh, out of this thing right here. So right in front of you there, the you rack little blue thing right here, with blue folder. Um, you're going to turn to number five uh, in that. Number five, and uh, the song is called uh, Christ the True and Better. And uh, I'll say a couple words about the song uh, before, we, before we sing it. But the first thing I want to do, uh, I'd like you to stand with me and then I'm going to pray. So let's go ahead and stand as we uh, prepare to sing. And uh, we'll uh, work off some of that lunch that we just had with how energetic, how energetic our singing is. Um, so let's pray, let's pray together. Father, we thank you for being with us, and we thank you for uh, just a reminder uh, this morning. Um, well, a few reminders I want to thank you for. First, fellowship. Um, your word says uh, that if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, complete my joy by being of the same mind. And there is great encouragement in Christ and great comfort from the love uh, that we experience being among uh, the brotherhood. Those who are in Christ, what a, what a blessing uh, it is to be uh, with other believers uh, today. And I uh, just pray uh, that, that each and every one of us will be getting out of this, uh, that which we need, so that we can grow in grace and really be like Jesus. Um, to live like him in our behavior and in our thought life, our emotions, uh, even on down to our feelings themselves, uh, make our, our lives like that of Christ himself. And uh, so we thank you, Lord, for the, uh, the fellowship that we have in your working on this. We thank you for the reminders of that of the gospel truth um, today. Um, and that is that, that we are saved by grace um, through faith, and it's because the Trinitarian God is the God who gives and serves and has given um, his son the cross on our and it's not so that we would merely be forgiven for the rest of our lives like we always were, but it's so that we would be changed, and so that we would walk in newness of life as he uh, rose from the dead. And so as we sing, uh, and as we prepare ourselves to, uh, to hear uh, more about what it is that we uh, can do to be better peacemakers and uh, conflict managers, um, I pray that you would, you would use this to... Uh, make us like that. For you said, uh, let's start the peacemakers, for uh, they will be called the children of God. May be true uh, among us, we pray. We pray that Christ will be glorified in all these things. Amen. Amen. So, uh, number five in the blue folder here in front of you Christ the truth is better. And uh, there's really just, um, really just some, some less what's called Christology in this song. Um, there are parallels all through the scriptural narrative to, uh, to Jesus so that we will know who he is. Um, and he's a better Adam, he's a better Isaac, a better Moses, a better David. Um, and indeed, he's the true, the true version of all of them and, uh, and himself, uh, the eternal God. So maybe you've never heard this song before. Actually, I just learned it this week. Um, so, uh, so we'll see how this goes. Christ the true and better. We'll sing the first two verses before we get to the chorus. So it'll be verses one and two, chorus, then verse three, chorus, verse four, chorus, uh, just like that. So we'll uh, do the best we can. Christ the true and better. Let's sing the Lord. Christ the true and better Son of God. Son of man, who went tempted in the garden, never yielded, never sinned. He who makes the many righteous brings us back to life again. Son of sacrifice, 
I want you to uh, consider, as we uh, spent the uh, first part of the morning kind of talking about self-aware, we're talking about um, tendencies that we have as men uh, to struggle in certain areas, um, along with prioritizing certain things in our lives. And then we spent the last part of uh, looking through James chapter 4, which gives us really helpful counsel as to how we can manage the conflicts that are there. What I, what I want you to consider, and I ask you to consider a relationship as you were uh, thinking through this. I want you to consider some life-dominating problems, and maybe you can share some with me. Um, what are some life-dominating problems that men struggle with at times? Yeah. Physical ailments. And difficulties physically. What else? Right. Depression. Yeah. Sorry? Pride. Pride, yeah. Not just men, women as well. Pride, yeah. Providing. providing. Yeah, being a provider. Sexual sin is a major one. Uh, do you know, I was on a men's retreat once and been on a lot of men's retreats, but on this one men's retreat, uh, I had no, never known this, that if you look at lists of sins in the scripture, sexual sin is never listed less than number three. It's either first, second, or third, it's never less than three. And it's because men struggle with sexual sin a lot. What else can we struggle with? Money, wealth, greed, yeah. <laughs> Choosing to die on too many hills, constantly thinking that we need to be white. Yeah. Substance issues. Um, some of us worry so much about our bodies. Um, some of us spend so much time in the gym making sure our bodies are strong and uh, we spend very little time in work. Um, what else? Anything else that you can think of? Retirement. You know, that is so hard for men because oftentimes what we do is we find our value in our jobs. And we find our value in the things that we do. And when that retirement is done, and when you know, we're out of that job, it's like we almost lost our value. Now, I, I don't know what your life dominating problem is. Uh, but what I would encourage you to know is that that life dominating problem is uh, that Christ gift is available to you when he looks at how you work through it. Now, we were talking earlier about emotions, and I was telling you that there is this physiological thing that happens, so I, I don't want to go too far with this, um, and I'm not a medical doctor, um, so, but I want to show you a diagram, and you can't see it very well, um, but at least you can see the brain that's in the middle. Um, so, there is a grace for control in your life when you go through an emotional crisis. Now, emotions are these wonderful gifts of God. Uh, emotions um, will encourage some of the greatest things that we can do. You know, uh, I, I get to be a leader in a 
a school, and I see sometimes kids just doing some really cool things for one another. And they come alongside and help. I can also see emotions do some of the most horrendous and regrettable things. Maybe you have said those young things in those emotions. Um, but these emotions are built into all people and built into all generations. Um, so wherever you go in the world, uh, north, south, east, or west, people have emotions. Now, emotions are complex. I gave you the light on the dashboard of my car. A check engine light is complex. A tire pressure light is not. A gas light is not. And so emotions are kind of like that way. There's some things that are really complex and you're going to really need some help to figure it out. That's what you know, pastors, pastoring, and the elders and deacons have done to help people. Right? That's where I counsel people for years. Sometimes you need somebody to come alongside you and help you with that. Because it's not as simple. You need somebody to help you. So emotions uh, are not inherently sinful. Now, I believe that there are emotions that are that may lead us to sinful things, and maybe they're being produced by sinful things, but I see emotions as kind of like a light on the dashboard of your car. And so, it's not sinful to be angry. I know people think that, but that's not what the Bible says. It says if you're angry, you're not sin. And Jesus had fear when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus actually displayed a myriad of emotions, and he clearly wasn't sinful. So we have a God who he loves, who shows emotions to us. At least uh, God man. So emotions in and of themselves are not sinful, but because, uh, because of sin in our own hearts, it's twisted, and human emotions can be twisted by sin. And so we need to recognize that uh, there are people today that I would say lead by emotions and experience, not the exposition of God's word. And that's a problem. So my emotions in and of themselves may not be sinful. My experiences may not be wrong, but when I let them lead me, I am putting myself in danger. That's why I have to interpret my emotions and my experience in light of the exposition of God's word. Now, this diagram that you see here is kind of your brain. And so in the back part of your brain, back here, by the back part of your brain, uh, that is where you take in information. You may not even realize it, but you will receive information, sights, sounds, smells, um, taste, they trigger, and it happens in the back part of your brain. And that's in the opposite area. Now, there is a section of your brain called the amygdala, and the amygdala is the part of your brain where it will cause you to fight, flight, or freeze. So some of you, when you get triggered, you're a fighter. Some of you, when you get triggered, you run. For others of you, when you get triggered, you just freeze. And that's happening in that amygdala portion of your brain. And so what happens in the back part of your brain is that right in the back part of your brain, that's where data enters. In the middle part of your brain, in the limbic system, that's where you start to feel. And if you remember that core emotion starting in you, you feel based on those core emotions. It's not until you get to the front part of your brain that you actually think rationally. Now, have you ever had a situation where you've been so ramped up with your emotions, and then 15 minutes later, it's like, I don't know why I said what I said. Maybe it's five minutes. Maybe it's five days. But your emotions ramp up and your rational thinking tends to diminish. That's exactly what is happening here. In the amygdala, you have the fight, fight, flight, or freeze. They trigger emotions, the emotions of anger, sadness, fear, all those emotions that we talked about before, the anger, the disgust, those core emotions are triggered. And what you do is you are feeling a nanosecond before you think. And for some of us, we start to feel so strongly that we don't think rationally. Now, James, I thought you said the, the way you think triggers the way you feel. Yes, it does, because it's been a history of thinking that is now triggering that emotional response. And that's why, for some of you, we have one event that happens. For some of you, you will get triggered with fear. Some of you will get triggered with shame. Some of you will get triggered with anger because you've habituated yourself that way. 
And if you're habituating yourself that way, as Jay Adams had used his quote earlier, you need to dehabituate and rehabituate. You need to stop a bad habit, or let's use biblical words. You need to put off and put on and be renewed in your thinking. And that's and that's what happens. But I want you to know that you could be the spiral. It's like flooding, and we'll talk about that in a moment. But there's hope. The hope is this, that through the gospel, God has redeemed you from the curse of sin. And in the gospel, God has given you the power to change. Pastor was just sharing that. It's not just that you are forgiven. <coughs> and these four words that I think of in the gospel. You are forgiven. You are free. You have a family. And you have a future. You're forgiven of the sin, all of it. There's no condemnation. Doesn't mean that you don't have to you know, you have consequences. I still have consequences for the choices I made decades ago. But I'm forgiven in Christ. I'm free, too. I don't have to bolt on that same word. I could actually say no. Scripture says you can say no to it. Titus tells us that. And family, for some of you, Maybe because of choices that you made, the families are gone. Or maybe it's not a choice that you made, they made the choice. You have no family. I can tell you in Christ. You've got a myriad of family members. Men, a myriad of family members here on this earth, and a myriad of family members that you will have in all of eternity. Here in the future. The beauty of the gospel is this this is not your best life now, it's not even close. I don't know how the guy made that much fun. I don't make that much fun doing it. Because non believers or Christians that don't know the gospel read that book. Your best life is not even close to hell. This is the closest we get to hell if you're a believer in Christ. Eternity of which. And for those that don't know Christ, this is their best life now. Yeah. So, in that limbic system, it's where you're feeling emotionally. I want you to think about this, that we have these two things we call them hijacking and flooding. Hijacking is where you have this overwhelming power of emotions in your amygdala, and it's flooding inside of, inside of you, it's overpowering you, and it's rapid, it's going so much that it goes beyond what rational thinking is. You are so caught up in the middle part of your brain that you're not thinking rationally. The other element is flooding. Flooding is where maybe you're in a relationship with somebody and you're raising up emotionally, and guess what they do? They raise up emotionally. And so now you're both spiraling, and that's what we call flooding. So whether you're being hijacked personally or flooding relationally, the emotions ramp up and it becomes overwhelming. I want you to watch this short video. And it comes from a movie called Cinderella Man. So Cinderella Man is about um, the box of wagon. And in this scene, I'll give you some backstories. He, uh, he, he is in the Great Depression. He has lost almost everything. He boxed before and he almost got killed. And he's afraid right now that he won't be able to um, provide for his family. So he may have to go back to box. And his wife is going to be in the kitchen as he is teaching his son how to box. And I want you to watch what happens. I want you to notice the responses that she goes through. And let's try to figure out what we can learn from this. All right, please watch the top, okay? I'll talk back. Come on.
Guess what was she experienced? Maybe some of you couldn't hear it in the back, but um, she is the man that he's going into box has killed two people already, and she's watching him teach boy kids at box. What what kind of emotions could she be going through right now? Fear, absolute fear. Anger. It feels like everything's out of her control because Jimmy's going to go and do this, and I. It's, she had visions of walking, and this woman walking in a funeral, uh, in a uh, cemetery, and that's she's envisioning that could be her future. Yeah, absolutely. And so, so as you as you think about it, when the emotions ramp up. Rational thinking tends to diminish. It's just the way patterns tend to go in our lives. So I can guarantee you, the more emotional you are, more often than not, you're not going to improve. And it, it happens so quickly, and what ends up happening is that you do things that you will easily regret. So I, I want you to think about some of the pain points that are here in your life. I want you to think about the things, the struggles, the trials. Um, for May, it was the fact that I may become a widow. For her, I'm in the depression. I don't want to lose my husband. We'll get through this together. I don't want you to go and fight. I don't want to have to raise these kids on our own. Whatever it is, I don't know what her pain points were. She had a lot of them. I don't know what your pain points are. And as I said, I help people who are in pain. And the pain is usually things either from their past or the present, but it is pain. And for us as men, we don't handle pain very well at times. Especially when it's relational pain, when it's emotional pain, we do not handle it well. Maybe we can break our hands and we can go back to work because, you know, blah, blah, blah. but when it comes to actually thinking and relating and emoting and connecting and talking and listening, we are. In general. And so I, I want you to consider how you handle your pain because when most people are in pain, they, they find themselves following a pattern. I won't spend too much time on this. Um, and as I said, I'll, I'll, if you want to give me your email, I'll send you all the PowerPoints and notes. So um, I'm not going to be able to do some of these. Um, but you'll get triggered. May got triggered. And she got triggered because she heard. Braddock back there box. I know, teaching the kids to box. And she felt some level of offense. And then she got defensive. You could hear it. And the anger was just, Arr! you're not going to box, you're going to go to school. And you could hear the anger. And when we do that, uh, oftentimes I find that fear controls anger. When I'm afraid, I try to take control of the situation. The situation it leads to anger, and that's exactly what was happening with May. She said, Stop boxing. She said, Stop boxing. Was there boxing in the house? The boxing fear, control, control wasn't being dealt with. Now she gets angry and she um, um, reacts. She sees herself as a victim. We oftentimes do. We develop this critical spirit within of the other person. And when we do that, it leads to you can see that she got so overwhelmed with her emotions, she got. 
What did she have to do? She got overwhelmed. She just left. I got to get out of here. To run. What happens with all of us at times? And, and so as you go through this, when, if you don't deal with it there, it can lead to hopelessness. It can lead to hardness of heart. It can lead to relational failures. What, what Jim did was what I hope we do as men. Did you notice how he went? Kids, time to go to bed. He went out there, and if you notice, the very first thing he did was he touched her. I'm here with you. And then he allowed her to talk, but then he said, you know, he tried to give her reasoning at the time. I have to believe that I have control of whatever is in my life, and that's not probably true. Um, in the movie, good movie, um, but in the movie, they didn't give her testimony. She was a strong believer. And they did not get her testimony in uh, that movie as strong as it should be. Uh, but he was trying to listen to her and comfort her. S O G, S is what? Self aware, I can't hear you. Um, what is the S? Self awareness. What's the O? Other awareness. Jim, Jim was other aware. Kids go here, and they go try to minister to mom. God aware. Okay, so now that moves us to, I, I want you to think about the personal struggles that you have. I encourage you, and maybe we'll do it a little bit later, I want to encourage you to talk to people about the struggles. I've got a good friend who we don't talk a lot because we're so busy, but I can text him and know he's going to be praying for me right away. When I'm finding temp feeling tempted, I can just say, hey, you know what, Joe, can you uh, pray me about something? There are people in your life that you need to have that are going to be healing and share your story with. Because if you keep it stuck inside, that's where the emotions are going to ramp up and life is just kind of take over. You, you need men, and this is what women do really well, and this is what we don't do well. Women have these groups where they talk to one another. Men don't. And it's one of the things that we desperately need. We need each other. Iron sharpens iron, right? We need to be able to sharpen one another. David had two people in his life, at least two, that talked to him. One, he had Jonathan. Jonathan, I would say, is the encouraging. I love you. I'm right there with you. I am your greatest cheerleader. And then he had Nathan. Nathan was the guy that put his finger in his face and you're the man. Sometimes you can get both in the same person. You need both. You need a cheerleader. Somebody that's going to come alongside you. I believe in you. I believe God's going to work with you. I'm there with you. I'm going to support you. But then you also need somebody that's not afraid to tell you the truth. So you need to share your stories with people so that they can help you. When we're on a journey, we need to try to walk a course. And what's the course? We need to figure out um, where God wants to take us. And I want you to think about building that bridge. So now we talked earlier about the issue and aim. And the wider the gap is between where you are with issues and where God wants you, the wider the gap, the greater the discord in your life. So now I want you to try to think through how we can narrow it. Let's try to think of another new crossing. Now, relationships are three levels. It is self, other, and God. It's not in that order. It should be God, self, and others, or God, other, and self. But um, there are three dimensions that are there. And I need to figure it out a way because my computer's going to go. So let me turn it this one. Behind the TV, there's an extension cord, the white cord, Beh directly behind the TV, the screen. Nope, that just unplugged it.
So sorry about that. We need power. <laughs> so um, relationships are three dimensional. There are let's build on the song, S O G, self aware, other aware, God aware, let's build on the that. And I want you to think about the fact that there are three relationships. The relationship with God, an inner relationship with yourself, and a relationship with others. I want you to think about the fact that you need to be aware of what other people do, and you need to engage with other people. So it's what you know and what you will do. So what do you know about God? What do I know about Amy Smith Long? What do you know about your children? What do you know about each other? It's about a knowing information. But there's a second piece. It's about awareness. I mean, about engagement. How are you going to connect with them? So it's not just what you know, it's also what you do. And so what we want to try to do is to think first about this level of God awareness. This God awareness is remembering. Back in the Old Testament, a lot of times God was saying you need to remember. Remember. He put these memorial stones out there, and he says, I want you to remember where you crossed the Red Sea. The memorial of um, the Passover. That as you do the Passover, you remind yourself that the death angel passed over and you were saved. These memorials were times where you would remember God. And most of our problem is that we tend to forget him in the midst of the struggles. And so instead of... In fact, I think our problem is that we remember what we should forget, and we forget what we should remember. And so inevitably, what happens is that I'm remembering things I should have just that in the past, and where I really need to be thinking, I don't remember. So God awareness is the fact that I remember him, but God engaging is that I am faithful to use the disciplines that God has given me. He's given me his word, he's given me prayer, he's given me a community of believers. I can engage God as I am disciplined and faithful to use those skills. Those skills. But men, once again, I, I won't ask you to raise your hand, but I did a survey just years ago, and I asked my people that I was working with, who had been Christians for well over 10 years, how many of you have read the whole Bible coming to cover? Genesis to Revelation. 66 books. You know it's less than 70 hours audio? You can actually listen to the whole Bible in less than 70 hours. Less than two work weeks. You know what percentage have read the Bible, cover to cover? Very small percentage. God has given you this amazing gift to engage him. We don't use it. So God awareness, God engagement. That means as I get in, as I remember God, and I go to his word, and I engage him through prayer, then he shows me more of myself. I become more self-aware. I can actually start to see myself. I can see myself with that humility, which we were talking about in James. That, that humbleness in your heart, because I start to see my sin, how great it is, in light of his glory, and that should humble me. Remember? Humble me, and God will lift you up. See, that self-awareness leads to humility, but then it leads to self-engagement. Anybody remember what the last of the fruit of the Spirit is? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and what? Self-control. See, that's where self-engagement comes in. I control my mouth. I control my actions. I control me. I control my mind. I have the ability by the power of the Holy Spirit to stop myself. So, as I become aware of God, I remember Him, and I become engaged with God, I am communicating with Him, He's communicating with me through his word, and now he's showing me myself, and I can see the humility that's happening in my heart, and that I'm humbling myself, making myself low, but then God is lifting me up, and he's giving me the power to say, no, this is James, you don't have to do this. That self-awareness and self-engagement lead to that other awareness, compassion. Jim went out to his wife, and instead of yelling and screaming at his wife, he touched his wife. He had compassion. He wanted to serve her. I need to provide for our families. We were talking about provision. I need to provide for our family, but that may mean that I put myself in harm's way to do it. I want to serve you. And so these are six skills. That if you can get these six skills, these six skills are important because if you don't, you're going to forget God. And if you don't, you'll be fickle. I'm in a Bible study today. I haven't opened the Bible in three weeks. 
Instead of humble, you're going to be proud, and instead of um, disciplined, you'll be indulgent. Instead of compassionate, you'll be insensitive, and instead of serving, you'll be manipulative. James is a nice little guy around. That's not really biblical. Really? Okay. Why don't we just show? I want to take this passage of scripture, well-known passage of Ephesians chapter four, just this one. I can give you a bunch, but I'm just going to give this one. Now the red sections are the God awareness got to give you. The green section might are the bluish green. It's all awareness, some engagement. The lighter green, other awareness, other engagement. So watch this. And do not be grieved. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed in the day of redemption. It's God. You. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, slander, and put away from all of you along with all malice. That you, self awareness, self engagement. Now others. Be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another. Back to God, even as God in Christ saves. There's so many passages of scripture that start with God, talk about you, talk about how you minister to others and go back to God. We call them 360 verses. And if you can think and can get that in the right order, Think about God and remember Him. Be faithful to use the gifts that He's given you to communicate with Him. Look at yourself in light of God, not in light of the other person. Humble yourself and do control yourself through self-control. And then minister by compassion and service to others. Your relationships can radically change. I can actually stop you and do this like this. So that is huge. I need you to, but more than a role in those things, I need you to embrace the gospel. Because it really is only in the gospel that transformation really occurs in real life happens. It's in the gospel that gospel changes and transforms everything. The gospel means good news. And it's the good news of knowing what God has done for you and for us in Christ, all of us in Christ. The gospel becomes this um, outpouring. Our relational wisdom becomes an outpouring of the gospel. Because the gospel talks about God and that the ultimately offended one, God, loved you enough to send his son. He came to rescue you and now he wants to use you to rescue other people. God awareness, God engagement, self awareness, self engagement, other awareness, other engagement. He poured out his love to you in God, in Christ. He wants to make himself, you, aware of him by the power of the Holy Spirit. I don't know what your theology is. I believe that the Holy Spirit opens blind eyes and opens dead ears and opens dead hearts to bring them to faith. My parents chose to whatever so that I could be conceived. But the reality is I didn't choose when I was going to be born. Somebody else chose that. The Holy Spirit brings us to life. But then what do we do? We confess Him. We say, thank you, Lord. I put my faith in Him. The faith that I even put in Him is given to me as a gift from God. It's just, just my mind. So I now become aware of Him because He has now made Himself in my presence. And now I engage Him by through faith and repentance. And then what does He do? Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians, He has given you to be a minister of Reconciliation. Not a minister of wrath, not a minister of control, not a minister of domination. He's given you the precious gift to be a minister of reconciliation so that people can know the good news of the gospel. He wants to transform you, he wants to change you, he wants to like pour water over you. But most of us tend to live our lives like legalists. It's amazing that God saves us by grace. But